SCSA Diagnostics. And the acronym stands for S is sperm, C is chromatin, because we're measuring, um, chromatin is DNA plus protein. We're measuring uh, the, uh, those two factors. And then uh, structure means the structure of DNA and protein put together, which is obviously has to be uh, appropriate in order for uh, the sperm to function properly. A is for assay, as uh, you might expect. Yeah. The company actually was some time ago, but we didn't commercialize until 19, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 2003, yeah. But um, what's sort of different from us is that I was the uh, father of this uh, concept of sperm DNA fragmentation. And uh, it was derived initially from my work at, when I was at co-faculty with uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and Cornell Medical School. I was challenged with the, um, the uh, question, was it, is it possible to measure uh, DNA damage uh, in sperm from men undergoing chemotherapy? These men and couples are obviously very concerned knowing that chemotherapy drugs are very uh, uh, damaging to DNA. So when they wish to have a child, they're concerned whether enough damage has been made or they might have a, uh, a failed pregnancy. Uh, the sperm is, well, for chemotherapy, obviously, uh, chemotherapy agents break DNA, right? Uh, then um, there's uh, uh, now considerable evidence that uh, various environmental factors um, uh, cause DNA damage. Uh, for example, we did a study in Mexico from uh, pesticide operators, uh, young guys who uh, had a very high level of damage uh, just from the uh, exposure to the pesticides. We did one study in the Czech Republic, uh, Teplitsa, that had, it was a valley town, had a very high level of air pollution from the uh, industrial smokestacks, and uh, there was a high level of infertility and miscarriages. The, uh, I joined an effort with the EPA and the Czech government, and we did a two-year study, and it turns out that the, uh, that, uh, the standard semen parameters were not significantly changed. But our data showed that there's a significant amount of DNA breakage, which is likely the cause of the particular pollutants. A couple who's experienced infertility, uh, usually the wife goes to the uh, reproductive endocrinologist first and uh, uh, to various tests, and then it's usually just they send the husband over to the urology clinic for a standard semen analysis. This analysis consists of light microscope assay for sperm count, motility, and morphology. However, the light microscope is looking at the, just the exterior of a cell. We're looking inside the genome, uh, which is the, obviously the half of the genome of the embryo. And we're looking for DNA damage or DNA strand breaks. And if a, if a DNA is broken in a region of a gene that's, re, that's necessary for uh, uh, paternal uh, uh, information for the embryo to grow, if that's broken, then the embryo dies. These last uh, 50 years or more, uh, almost all of the problems with um, uh, having a pregnancy, uh, miscarriages, uh, and ironically, not having a boy, <laughs> is all the woman's fault. <laughs> and and um, uh, that today is almost 50-50. Um, so that uh, we let the hook off the women in part by, by saying, hey, it's not all your fault. The man also has almost a 50% responsibility for a failed pregnancy. So In fact, uh, uh, today, roughly 20% or one out of five couples uh, uh, now are in that category of infertile. So it's a huge problem. That's uh, many millions uh, uh, in, in around the world. Samples come from a clinic. The man has a certain level of damage. He says, okay, now what do I do? And uh, there's various things. One, um, uh, we send the uh, man to urologist who checks for what's called a varicocele. A varicocele is an abnormal uh, I say valve in the, uh, the blood flow to the testis. And of course, this reason men have a scrotum is that the testis should be two degrees cooler than the body temperature in order to make good sperm. So if this blood flow uh, causes increase in temperature. So that can be fixed. We have uh, several studies uh, in, from our lab 
where we have uh, identified men uh, with a, uh, a varicocele and a high level of DNA fragmentation. They fixed the varicocele and from our studies and another study in, uh, other studies in uh, Montreal, uh, uh, Canada, uh, they show that that's fixed and the pregnancy rate has increased. Most of the um, environmental problems can be um, uh, self, the body fixes them, uh, as long as it doesn't make mutagenic uh, uh, damage, permanent damage to the DNA. Other things like uh, radiation, uh, x-rays, and uh, some of those, they make, some can make permanent damage. And we know of uh, cases where, uh, even from chemotherapy, it's, uh, the, the, the sperm are totally, uh, the stem cells are totally damaged, there's no recovery. We have worked with um, cancer patients, and cancer patients that come in usually have a, uh, a uh, deteriorated level of sperm DNA quality just from the disease itself. And so these samples are often then banked, uh, and then later on, a year or two, hoping that the chemotherapy wasn't severe enough so that they will then uh, have normal spermatogenesis come back, we compare the sample at that time, so it be two years later, with the sample that was frozen. And whichever's one best, they then may use for uh, uh, trying to have a child. With regard to other fixing, I mean, I'll back up and say, there are some clinics that say, we don't care what the problem is, how it is, we're gonna use this new innovation called intercytoplasmic sperm injection, which stands ICSI. They simply find a sperm, uh, inject it into the egg, and they say, if you got a sperm, you fix the problem. Not true, uh, although that's an efficient way of causing a pregnancy, uh, there are ways that you can fix this problem so you still have the child naturally. And that would be um, uh, things like uh, reducing body weight, BMI, uh, eating pr properly with uh, emphasis on antioxidants. Uh, this is a, uh, as you see in the cereals and stuff today, this is, has this kind of antioxidants because the bottom line of damage is caused by what's called oxidative stress. We live in an oxygen environment and th uh, that's, we need that, but there's a side, a downside to that of having uh, free radicals coming off of that by, by just the oxygen or by other factors and it's the free radical that breaks the DNA. So we have a patient um, lifestyle, BMI, uh, some medications uh, can cause a problem. They can go off of those for a while and then come back on again while the sperm quality improves. Uh, and fixing the varicocele, um, and that's the primary suggestion to the doctor to fix the patient that has this problem. In talking about uh, oxidative stress, uh, it is the factor that is probably responsible for aging. And the testis is no exception, so that with age, one might expect uh, that to have increased damage. We did an extensive study with the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California with 100 men uh, who working there or had worked there, non-smokers and healthy lifestyle. And this question was simply, what are the changes with sperm with age? A 20 year old simply typically has like three, four percent of, of, of sperm with fragmented DNA, which is uh, minor and okay. Uh, that increases every year and we found that on the average, when a man reaches 50 years of age, that he will have 25% of the sperm with fragmented DNA. This is the clinical threshold. When, one is, when a man has more than 25% of sperm um, uh, damage, we say he statistically placed into the category of a longer time to pregnancy, uh, more miscarriages, or no pregnancy. Uh, so, uh, but men are much more heterogeneous than women. I mean, for women, when you get that 36 to 40 years age, their uh, ovaries sort of just shut down. We have men that, uh, for whatever reasons, for their own natural self-defenses, the, um, um, uh, we hear of men that 80 years old and 70 years old uh, father a child. Uh, but that's um, uh, also putting it high on the risk side. What happens sometimes, scenario, is that the older man will come with the younger new wife to the doctor and says, we're trying to have children. And the doctor says, well, sir, have you had any children before? Yes, I have two children. He may say, oh, you're fine, you're fertile. Uh-uh, 
He had his children when he was in his 20s. Now he's 50, and he could be the problem, likely the problem, as opposed to his younger wife. I think the bottom line is that the, the, the public's been educated. You know, I can think of myself, my wife, uh, back in the days of spraying uh, DDT, I think it was, on our 240, whatever the we kids would stand at the end of the field to serve as a marker for the guy who's spraying to know where to turn around. Um, this is without the face mask of protection. This isn't done anymore. There are strict rules for the guard these days to handling it with uh, gloves and uh, face masks and so forth. Uh, and there's always new combinations of chemicals. So one chemical itself may not be a problem, and the other one may not be a problem, but you mix the two together, you have now have a real problem. I mean, there's a lot of things from old wives' tales, what should do and not do and so forth. Um, simply, um, uh, the simplest one is the common recommendation that uh, after uh, uh, intercourse, that a woman simply uses a pillow to raise her pelvis so that by gravity, uh, more sperm will enter the uterus. And, and so, in, in s some papers we now say that um, one should probably have, around the time of ovulation, to have like sex every day so that you have fresh sperm. Now, for men who are suffering from a low sperm count, they may say, oh, wait, you need to wait two or three days. So, there's some of these types of uh, directions that are relative to the uh, particulars of the patients. I think the, the, the bottom line message is that if, for example, you have uh, not had success. I mean, the, the couple appears to be okay in terms of the, the female doctor and the male doctor. There's no pregnancy within six to eight months. They should have a test like this here because this is probably 25% of the problems that we alone by this technology can detect. Considering that the, what the costs and expense, the uh, whole ordeal of uh, artificial technologies, uh, this type of test can be done to see whether the patient, the man's sperm is okay or not. So much emphasis on the woman, but now we know it's like half of the men. So with this simple test, you can learn at least whether the man is okay or not. And you can then deal with the situation as uh, that outcome is seen, right? So we can ask the question like, you know, who should have a sperm DNA fragmentation test? It would be that couple that has like a year's time without um, any success. Um, men who uh, are smokers, this is a significant problem. Um, the, uh, we talked about varicocele, if the, uh, if the uh, heat, too much heat to the testis. Also, there's obviously recommendations to wear like boxer shorts instead of briefs. Uh, hot tubs uh, and jacuzzis are really bad. Uh, that is a, a high temperature, and this can be uh, cause a major problem. Stay out of those, so the hot shower, long hot showers. And um, I guess it's not just good lifestyle, but including nutrients that contain a lot of antioxidants. Uh, the uh, primary person uh, could go to is the women's clinic this, at Sanford uh, uh, Clinic in Sioux Falls, Dr. Keith Hansen and Dr. Jan Bran John Branian. Uh, they do these uh, tests there and then, in fact, they collect the sample and then every week they send uh, those samples up to us to measure and we report back to them. We're sort of the grandfather of the whole concept of sperm DNA fragmentation. Uh, we started this way back in 1980 at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And uh, at that time, my uh, boss wanted to immediately go to the human uh, clinic. And I said, no, I don't really understand what the test is measuring. I want to have full confirmation, quality control to understand what it's about. So we, when I moved here uh, to South Dakota State University in 1983, we ran uh, more than 100,000 sperm samples from, uh, from the livestock, uh, mouse model system, and so forth, and almost every ways uh, clinically and biochemically to say we are absolutely certain this test is um, solid as, as gold. So that's what we commercialized then in 2003 and uh, success brings uh, competition which is a good sign and now there are probably about three different tests that say they can do the same thing. Um, they uh, use much of our data to help back their statements up but um, uh, uh, so, but we're still known as the golden assay. 
We have uh, this laboratory here, which we uh, have uh, about 100 clinics or so, sending samples to us from the States, North America, and uh, also internationally. Um, but we also have franchises in um, Paris, London, Sweden, Denmark, Rabat, Morocco, Coimbatore, India, and Australia. Some of those, they send samples directly to us. Some of those, their technicians come here, they're trained for a week, and we're sent back, and we do quality control to make sure they're doing exactly right, because the differences between being in the category of okay to being subfertile or infertile is too narrow to have any mistakes. In order for them to say that they are doing the SCSA test, they must, uh, we must exchange samples like once a year for like 10 samples, and the, if the data isn't exactly the same between the two laboratories, then we will try to figure out what the problem is to make absolutely certain that the results are correct. As far as the process, um, uh, most of our samples are received from clinics, a sperm lab probably for a standard semen analysis, and then they will then take an aliquot of that, put it into a little vial, and then uh, flash freeze it, put it in um, liquid nitrogen or uh, dry ice, send it to us, and then we um, measure that sample within a day or so. Uh, we send the data back uh, through a secure website, so the doctor will have the results within a couple of days. When the sample comes in, they are then uh, placed into a liquid nitrogen tank, which are held there until it's time to measure them. The sample is taken out, um, uh, thawed, uh, uh, the sample is diluted to the right sperm concentration, and then the critical step is that we treat the sperm with a low uh, pH for 30 seconds. This low pH then allows the double-stranded DNA where there's a break to open up. We use a dye called acridine orange. This integrates into double-strand nucleic acid, normal DNA, and it fluoresces green under a blue laser light. However, if it's broken, then the acridine orange stacks on that single strand, it collapses into a crystal, and when that blue laser light hits that, there's a metachromatic shift to red fluorescence. The more red fluorescence, the greater the amount of DNA strand breaks. And we can quantitate both the number of sperm that have the strand breaks, and also the extent of strand breaks. What's totally unique here is that we measure the individual, individual cells, 5,000 sam 5, sperm per sample, and we can tell every, what every single sperm, single sperm, has with regard to its integrity of DNA. We can sort, physically sort out by the flow cytometer a group of cells, so we wonder what are they about. We've done that to show that uh, they have other characteristics, like the different morphologies, different uh, uh, means of um, uh, various sperm factors to ask what is it that's about these broken DNA strands. Just a simple biochemistry factor that um, uh, acridine orange um, will simply, it goes into uh, double strand DNA and the single strands, it also is attracted to just ionic attraction and it, uh, then stacks along that single strand, because there's no double strand to intercalate, then it collapses in this crystal, and then the uh, blue laser light hits that and causes a red fluorescence. Every single dot is a sperm, so that um, uh, some other labs say that, well, we measure individual cells. There are some assays that were uh, taken up after our pioneering work, and they say measure only 50 cells. And they say that we, those 50 cells, we can look at the amount of DNA damage. But we also measure that in individual cells on a, on a scale of 1,024 on the x-axis, 1,024 on the y. So we have two parameters uh, that define that cell exactly with the amount of DNA damage. And then we have 5,000. So the statistical robustness of the allowed by the flow cytometer of measuring like 5,000 cells per sample just is so superior to those that are doing from 50 to like 200 cells and uh, the odds are so much greater that our results are more precision, especially relevant when the window is so narrow with regard to what's good and what's not good for the prognosis and diagnosis and prognosis and recommendations to the infertile couple. The primary instrumentation is the flow cytometer 
and that was uh, developed way back in the uh, 70s. In fact, uh, our laboratory in New York was one of three laboratories that helped develop this um, instrumentation. Um, so it was um, uh, initially uh, designed for trying to do uh, pap smears uh, results from it, but uh, it's now useful uh, for many things. So these are just standard instruments. Um, the primary use for them in medicine today is uh, looking at the presence of uh, antigens using tagged antibodies. In fact, you can now measure like eight parameters per cell at rates of like a thousand per second. So you're making 8,000 measurements per second uh, on your uh, pathological specimen. What makes us stand out is that we have a process that can be done on other computers. However, we do have a proprietary software this proprietary software takes the data, which is on just red, amount of red and green fluorescence, and it uh, puts it into an algorithm that then uh, presents the cells in a different um, orientation. And this allows a, uh, when taking a frequency histogram of this orientation, one could be much more precise with regard to the actual number of cells are, that are damaged. Um, so we estimate that rough, some of the, so we have some competitors that try to use our assays, probably published, but they don't have the proprietary software. We estimate that roughly one out of five of those samples uh, have uh, an error in them uh, that we would not have when they're using our proprietary software. So there's a proprietary software that's special to our efforts. Here are two examples of uh, different patient results. This one is, uh, here's the sperm that is sitting here green fluorescence, which means uh, it's uh, got good DNA integrity, and virtually no cells that have DNA fragmentation. So this would get a score of being excellent. In sharp contrast, you see this man had most of his cells with DNA, de uh, DNA damage. This could well have come from a couple that had experienced like four or five miscarriages, uh, and the likely reason for the miscarriages is that the Sperm, the egg does not discriminate against the sperm that's fragmented DNA. It will fertilize the egg, it will then transfer, and, but the embryo may well die at the early stage.